Max Highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Welcome to the show, which starts off today on the catwalk at Paris Fashion Week. Here's what else is on the way. Don't just stand there. We visit the World Living Statues Festival. Last installment, David Chipperfield is renovating another museum in Berlin. And monkey business, we take a trip to Gibraltar, which is home to all types. The spring summer collections for 2015 were the focus at the recent Paris Fashion Week, but the talk of the town was designer Jean-Paul Gaultier. After 38 years in the business, he put on a spectacular runway show to mark his last ever ready-to-wear collection. Gautier is a pioneer in the fashion world and always broke the boundaries with his designs. This runway was no exception as he's hired some older models to walk the catwalk and help make his last show one to remember. At his final ready-to-wear show, Jean-Paul Gaultier wanted to prove yet again he has what it takes. The staging was fanciful, featuring a fictitious Miss Gaultier beauty contest and the selection of the master's best-known designs which continue to turn heads today. Gaultier is giving up his ready-to-wear line for financial reasons. In spite of his famous name, it's losing money. Times have changed. I've been designing clothes, ready to wear fashion for 38 years. I've done lots of collections and lots of clothes, but fewer and fewer people are wearing Pret-a-Porter. Now it has to be really, really cheap to sell. People are no longer willing to shell out money for clothes. Today there are too many brands, there's too much competition, less scope for creativity. It was the highlight of the Paris Fashion Week, Jean-Paul Gaultier's last Pret-a-Porter show, held at the cinema Le Grand Rex. Countless fans turned out to watch. It's too bad. We'd rather he'd have kept on, but it's up to him, not his fans. But only a select few were allowed in, including celebrities like Catherine Deneuve and Amanda Lear. It's his last Pret-a-Porter show, so it's an event. We're here because we're friends. Many colleagues from the fashion business attended, such as Albert Elbaz, Jeremy Scott, and even 92-year-old Pierre Cardin. He was a student in my fashion house. He trained there. I'm here to show my friendship and my respect for his talent. And it was his creativity that set Jean-Paul Gaultier apart. Right from the start, he turned the fashion world on its head. His love of provocation, his gender-bending styles, and his unconventional sense of beauty earned him the moniker of Enfant Terrible. He enlarged the spectrum of what's considered beauty, and, and, and shapes, and sizes, and ages. And he was a designer who was never willing to compromise. That's why uh, this is his last show, because he wanted to create real fashion. And I think he was always underlying in each of his show that fashion is not about commerce. Fashion is about fantasy, it's about dream. Who around us is dressed in Jean-Paul Gaultier? We all have the image of Gaultier in our heads and would like to dress in his fashions. But today, who wants to take the risk of dressing in clothes by the enfant terrible of fashion? He totally revolutionized fashion the way men and women dress. And with his last Pret-a-Porter show, the beloved designer delighted his supporters once again. It was all very joyful, something that only Jean-Paul Gaultier could do. Everyone expected a sad goodbye, and he turned it into a marvelous spectacle. It was perfect, you know, it's perfect. Humorous and uh, high camp, what you expect. Jean-Paul Gaultier now plans to concentrate on developing perfumes and haute couture. In haute couture, I can still work as I like in the traditional way, with plenty of precision and artistic freedom. But some wonder if that will be enough for him. 
I'm sure he'll still do things. I can't imagine Jean-Paul retreating to his ivory tower to just do haute couture and evening gowns. First of all, Jean-Paul Gaultier plans to make the most of his newfound freedom. I'll go to the movies or to exhibitions, things I haven't had time for. Well, sometimes it's good to start a new chapter, isn't it? Now, moving on, we're off to the Dutch city of Arnhem, where street artists from all over the world gathered for the World Living Statues competition. I'm talking about artists who disguise themselves as statues here. I'm sure we've all seen them at tourist hotspots, standing there as stiff as a rake before they suddenly come alive and frighten you half to death. At this year's 10th anniversary festival, we went to check out some of the best in the game. The art of standing completely still and then wowing the crowd. The Dutch city of Arnhem is once again hosting the annual World Living Statues Festival, this time with entries from 24 nations. There are three awards up for grabs, decided by a jury and the public. Patrick van Horn is in the professional class. He makes around 50 paid appearances a year and already scooped the Belgian championships back home last summer. This is his second attempt at the world crown. I do most of my costumes myself, but I had this one made because it was so difficult. There are familiar old faces in the changing area, where you get a first impression of the sheer variety of costumes in competition. One couple is posing as figurines made from the Netherlands' famous blue and white Delftware pottery. The toughest part is having a good idea, a new idea. For the World Championships, you have to be original. This participant from Britain is going completely undercover. People walk past me, they don't, they don't see me, which is really nice. So then when I, when I move, I usually get a, a big surprise. Time for Van Horn to likewise apply those finishing touches, in his case, camouflaged as a piece of wood. I'm not here to win. I'm here to have a great day. Hair lacquer helps to fix the makeup in place before he dons his costume. The foam that makes up his coat is flexible enough, but when his performance starts, the transformation into hardwood sculpture is complete. Once somebody throws a coin into the bowl, the action begins. It looks like he's made out of a block of wood. Even his head has a mahogany-like shine. It looks great. <laughs> I have to laugh, also because of the play on wood. You can see it's made of wood. Part of being the perfect living statue means finding the right balance. And that includes between the still and moving parts of the performance. Occasionally, the public manages to surprise the artist. Once there was this old lady who was moved to tears by my act. She even hugged me. And at the same event, there was also a man who took photo after photo of my pedestal, although I wasn't standing on it. I was taking a break at the time. The World Living Statues Festival is overseen by a jury of three experts, but the overall vote is split 50-50 with the public's opinion. There are no set rules for determining what exactly qualifies as a living statue. We look at the way they are, they are designed, the quality of their uh, the costumes and the makeup, and we look at the way of interaction, gaming and playing with the audience. That's a very important thing. You can do much or you can keep it subtle. As a living statue, I do prefer interaction, which is subtle. All contestants appear on stage once more before the winners are announced. And then the wait is over. Patrick van Horn finishes in second place. He's beaten only by a Dutch group called Favondering, which means amazement. Speaking of which... I wasn't expecting it. A massive surprise. A 
moving moment for the masters of immobility. Plus 1,000 euros, not a bad payoff for just standing around. Sometimes stationary objects create a talking point. And that is certainly true with David Chipperfield's latest installation at the new National Gallery here in Berlin. The award-winning British architect will be expanding his credentials here next year as he's also been commissioned to renovate the gallery after his installation has stood the test of time. David Chipperfield has installed a forest in the open glass hall of the new National Gallery. The installation, entitled Sticks and Stones, is made up of 144 tree trunks. It's the last show here before the gallery closes for five years. Chipperfield will then be in charge of renovating the spectacular structure, designed by Mies van der Rohe. This room is famous because it's a 50-meter column-free space in a sort of playful way. We thought it could be interesting to put columns in a column-free space and play with the sort of essential issues of architecture, the column being a very intense idea of architecture, a very intense moment of architecture, supporting and creating space. The spruce that symbolically support the roof are eight meters tall. They were felled for the installation and then stripped of their bark. Trees were the first columns, and that brought us to the title, Sticks and Stones. The gallery has not been renovated since it opened in 1968. And since it's a listed building, the renovation has to respect strict guidelines. With David Chipperfield, we can be sure that the architecture will be treated with respect and sensitivity. This is not about building something new, but about protecting what we have and improving the technical infrastructure. Chipperfield is one of the world's most prestigious architects. His museums are glorious. His extension to the Folkwang Museum in Essen opened in 2010. His Turner Contemporary that opened the following year is credited with reviving the fortunes of the depressed seaside town of Margate, east of London. Chipperfield loves creating such venues. You're making rooms that people have to walk through and look at art. I mean, it's, a, it's nearly as close to pure architecture as, you know, because what is the task? The task is to make good spaces. Um, you know, if you're making a railway station, it's another interesting task, but quite dominated by other responsibilities. Perhaps his most impressive project to date is his reconstruction of the Neues Museum in Berlin, which dates from the mid-19th century, but was half destroyed by bombs in the Second World War. What Chipperfield did was a magical mix of restoration, repair, and new construction. We had this fortune of, of working on Noise Museum for all its complexities and all of its difficulties. It was an amazing experience which for 12 years brought us very tightly in, into the city. The reborn Neues Museum draws huge crowds. It's become a major landmark that itself tells a story about the history of the city. Part of Berlin's continuous um, personality is to do with its self-description. Architecture is a powerful um, part of that self-description, and therefore, um, I think it's a very, it's an exciting city to be an architect in. Five years on from the Neues Museum, he now turns his attention to the new National Gallery. David Chipperfield's 144 tree trunks will be felled again at the turn of the year before the builders move in. Playing with people's perceptions is something many artists like to do. British artist Nicola Malkin sees no boundaries when it comes to size. To her, there's no reason why something that's known to be small cannot also be charming on a larger scale. 
Her speciality is in ceramic larger-than-life jewellery pieces, and her work has caught the eye of several fashion designers. It can now be seen published in a number of magazines, but we got a closer look when we visited her home studio in Surrey. You'd hardly wear these pearls with a little black dress. This pendant would break in a normal chain. And this is not a bracelet you'd wear around your wrist. Ceramic artist Nicola Marken playfully explores the relationship between objects and space. Scale is important. I think when I first started doing this kind of work, obviously it's large scale, um, and there was a lot of, oh, you're so tiny, your work's so big. It was like, okay, maybe I've got a Napoleon complex or something. But um, I don't really think about what people are going to think of my work or what's going to happen to it afterwards. It just kind of happens. So they're just, they're just kind of objects that I have an idea about and want to make. Malkin's sculptural jewellery has been exhibited in galleries in Europe and the United States, as well as in the prestigious Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Her works successfully bridge the worlds of art and pop culture. They also regularly feature in fashion shoots. The fashion world got me a lot of publicity when I first graduated. Um, shops were really keen to display my work in their windows. And so for me it was kind of, um, th that's how I kind of got started. And then galleries were interested because they like the press. Um, I'm happy to be kind of crossing over into all these different worlds and different industries. It's good for me. It kind of brings a wider audience to my work as well. The 34-year-old British artist lives in the county of Surrey, about a half an hour's drive from London. Her studio is in the garden. She's best known for her signature giant charm bracelets. Each charm tells a story, a biography in the form of jewelry. The individual elements are all made by hand. The bracelets cost between 1,800 and 6,300 euros, depending on their complexity. They're made strictly by order. Her customers get their inspirations from any number of sources. Sometimes they'll like the charms they've already seen and they'll just kind of go with that. Um, and, but then other times I'll have a chat with them and find out about what they've kind of been up to, whether they've had children, where they've travelled to. Um, I just did one uh, that was a gondola for someone because that's where he proposed to his wife on a gondola in Venice. And uh, another one was a flamingo for a couple that were obsessed with flamingos. Don't quite know why, but they, it was a really good charm. Nicola Malkin is not alone in this field. For decades now, U.S. artist Jeff Koons has been fetching record prices with his blown-up, highly stylized reproductions of banal objects. Many critics call it kitsch. People have described my work as kitsch, and uh, sometimes I don't know how to take that, because kitsch can be seen as derogatory. I don't have a problem with kitsch. I don't know, sometimes it's a kind of a bit of a throwaway kind of term for whimsical, trashy objects. I think because my work is quite playful, and quite fun and colorful, um, people use the word kitsch, but it's fine. There's also something quite charming about Nicola Markin's work. Her giant charm bracelets are not just outsized pieces of jewelry, but an entire art collection in miniature. And to finish the show today, we are off to Gibraltar, a peninsula off Spain in the Mediterranean Sea. For the last 300 years, Britain has ruled over Gibraltar, and as legend would have it, the British rule will last as long as there are monkeys on Gibraltar. 
Bizarrely, for now, it is the only place in Europe where wild monkeys actually roam. But of course, there's a lot more to the place than that. It's either the duty-free shopping, the warm weather, or the many impressive sights that draw the tourists in. Gibraltar is home to what is probably the most famous rock in Europe. The British Overseas Territory covers only around 6.5 square kilometers. Some 30,000 people live here. And it is also home to at least 200 Barbary apes, or macaques. Eric Shaw feeds and monitors the animals every morning. These are the last wild, free-ranging primates in the whole of Europe. That is quite incredible when you consider we're in Europe. We expect to find them over there in Africa. So from that point of view, we've got to try to preserve them, not just for us, but for the rest of Europe. Each ape gets a pound of fruit and vegetables every morning. They have to find the rest of the food themselves, but that's not a problem. After all, they are one of Gibraltar's top attractions. Some three million tourists come to see them each year. There's a legend that says Gibraltar will remain under British rule as long as there are apes on the rock. We really don't know how the monkeys originally finished here in Gibraltar. They've been here in Gibraltar for about 310 years with British. They've always been here since the British came here in 1704. One of Gibraltar's oldest buildings, the Moorish Castle, is a reminder that the territory was once ruled by the Moors. They were followed by the Spanish, then the British. I would describe a Gibraltarian as being a Latin Brit. So that's how I would describe ourselves, because we are efficient and we are not maybe as laid back as the Spanish, um, we, but we do enjoy our typical British pint in the sun. Gail Francis Tyrone was Miss Gibraltar in 1985. Now she works in tourism. One of her favorite spots is St. Michael's Cave. Further beneath the rock, you'll find 42-year-old Mario Baloki. He's been showing people around the caves for a decade. It's a remarkable subterranean world full of enormous stalactites and stalagmites. underground lakes, too. This site attracts around one million tourists each year. What I like of the shop is uh, the beauty of my cave. Uh, I like to show people what's, uh, what they expected to do. It's, it's enjoyable. It's not a normal walking tour. Back in the open air, visitors can see downtown Gibraltar. It has a typically British feel, even though Spain is right next door. The Spanish and British governments have often faced political tension over Gibraltar. But the British who live there say they feel fine in their sunny enclave. Among them are Kathy Field and her husband Jim. For more than 20 years now, they've been running a sailing school. Sometimes, lucky students even get to see dolphins. The place is also great for scuba diving. The waters off the coast feature many wrecks, like this steamer. British diving instructor Tony Watkins comes here often with his pupils. The SS Rosslyn sank in 1916 during a storm. The African coast is just 14 kilometers away. It was at this point that Hercules split the two mountains with his club. Geologically, it actually happened because five million years ago, the Mediterranean was a dry desert, a basin, and the two mountains were joined together. And you had the force of the Atlantic make in, making a crack through the two mountains and opening the mountains apart. So you had the largest waterfall the world had ever known, which was the Atlantic filling up the then dry Mediterranean basin. Evenings on the rock are tranquil. The tourists are gone for the day, but tomorrow they'll be back.
Well, as the sun sets here in Berlin as well, we have come to the end of the show. So until next time, all that's left for me to do is say on behalf of all of the team here, thank you for watching, take care, and as we say in Germany, tschüss.